Hey guys, this is Miss Hernandez, and I'll be reading your Unit 2 Shadow Shaper Unit Test. This test includes three parts. Part 1, Core Knowledge of the Novel. Part 2, Application to Shadow Shaper. Part 3, Application in a New Text. Here are some tips to help you do your best. Be sure to read all the directions carefully. Read and annotate all text provided. Read each question carefully. Read all answers before you make your choice. Use process of elimination, and if you see a quotation or section of the text reference, go back and skim that part of the text before you choose your answer. Use your notes to help you. You can use this piece of scratch paper to eliminate your multiple choice questions and plan your open response. Good luck and try your best. Section 1. Core Knowledge of the Unit Do your best to answer these questions based on your understanding of the novel Shadow Shaper. You may use your book and knowledge organizer to help you answer the questions. 1. Which description from the novel symbolizes the gentrification happening in Sierra's community? A. We used to be able to see all the way down the block, past Carlos's corner store at the church, and then down beyond the hospital. Y ahora, carajo. The blankness of void, vacant, stupid. B. All of the windows were rolled down in Neville's dark blue 1969 Cadillac Civil and the wind whipped across Sierra's face as they zipped north along the FDR. C. Sub-basement 7 looked more like a warehouse than a library. Metal shelves stretched into the darkness of a vast gray hall. D. Sierra thanked him, grabbed a pack of gum and icy at Carlos's bodega, and then leaned against the wall in the shade of the red awning. 2. Read the excerpt below. The commotion from the pool area got louder, through the forsythia and pumpkin vine, Sierra saw a middle-aged man stomping through the party with an even gait. He wore an old winter jacket and stained khakis that didn't quite fit. His skin was pale, like hospital fluorescence, and dull, cataractic eyes glared out from his grayish, weathered face. Kid stood back, giving the stranger a wide berth. Robbie shoved the notebook into his shoulder bag. We gotta go, he said again. Which literary techniques achieve suspense in this section? A. Just a position and imagery. B. Mood and metaphor. C. Imagery and dialogue. D. Dialogue and symbol. 3. The juxtaposition of Laz and Lucetta is meant to A. Emphasize how patriarchy and mar matriarchy view power differently. B. Depict their unified front as the co-leaders of the shadow shapers. C. Portray Laz as human and Lucera as immortal. D. Contrast how men and women embrace their spirituality. 4. All of the following are awakenings that Sierra, that Sierra experiences except A. She realizes her neighborhood is gentrifying, which makes her displaced within it. B. She finds out teenage romance does not typically last beyond an intense shared experience. C. She becomes aware of family rifts that occur along the lines of age and gender. D. She learns that allyship with friends like Lydia is a way to challenge institutional racism. E. She discovers even more about her friends and seeing identity and how complex identities can be. 5. Why does Older include Wix's research notes about the shadow shapers in the story? A. To draw a parallel between Wix's research process and Sierra's investigation. B. To demonstrate the humility he feels towards Lucetta. C. To expose Lazaro's troubled relationship with his daughters. D. To contrast Wix's desire for power with Sierra and Robbie's curiosity and appreciation. 6. What is significant, significant about Robbie's tattoos? A. They represent family members who have passed away. B. They contain secret messages about shadow shape, but about how to shadow shape. C. They celebrate his ancestry and are forms to shadow shape with. D. They reveal that he is more skilled at body art than murals. 7. How does Tia Rosa's bigotry expose one of Sierra's internal conflicts? A. Sierra questions if she's enough because of her skin color. B. Sierra feels unsupported in her relationship with Robbie. C. Sierra is unsure if her mother is actually trustworthy. D. 
Sierra does not see herself as knowledgeable about her own heritage. 8. What larger theme does Older develop about art in the novel? A. Without art, an urban setting becomes unrecognizable. B. Art can be activism and affect social change. C. Art outside of its traditional forms is not art. D. You do not have to be an artist to make meaning. 9. Which symbol comments on the dangers of culture appropriation? A. The lush grounds of Columbia University. B. The fading murals of people from Sierra's neighborhood. C. The Shadow Shaper praise song about the crossroads. D. The fierce dragon at the center of Sierra's mural. 10. Which two details from chapter 12 in the novel indicate a shifting mood? A. It wrapped her up in a fragrant cloud that seemed to carry her into the kitchen, disentangling her cares and worries away. B. She almost always fitted back and forth like an anxious hummingbird. C. She dolled out sloppy cheek kiss kisses to Sierra and Maria and then settled into a chair at the table. D. Sierra's arms twitched with the impulse to swing out at her mom's, on her aunt's makeup saturated face, but she resisted. E. Her mom would always chide Rosa lightly, and then the conversation would turn to something else. This is an excerpt in section two. Application to Shadow Shapers. Read the excerpt from Shadow Shapers when Robbie and Sierra are in the club and it's the first time Sierra sees the spirits. Then answer the questions below to the best of your ability in a powerful paragraph. You can use your book to help you answer this question. You should write a claim and include at least two pieces of evidence to support your answer. This is an excerpt from Shadow Shapers pages 91 through 93. Here, Sierra is seeing the spirits for the first time in Club Cloud 4. Sierra spun slowly around. Each wall of Club Cloud 4 was covered with an epic masterpiece rendered in Robbie's distinctive graffiti-like style. You see, she said, you say you're not slick, and yet here we are in this romantic little club surrounded by all your hot paintings. I think you might be slick, mister. Robbie replied with, who, me? He shrugged. There's more. It was the kind of line that would have struck Sierra as cocky if he hadn't said it with such a solemn face. He walked up to the wall and then turned to face the club. Do you see anything around the place? Anything strange? Sierra looked around the room. There were a few more scattered couples. A, doll, a full family of six eating dinner in a far corner. A pretty waitress in her thirties walking from table to table putting down silverware. Not particularly. Squint, he said. Robbie said. What? Try to relax your vision if that makes any sense. It doesn't. It's called soft eyes. Don't look at any one thing. Just sort of squint at the room so it becomes blurry. Sierra closed her eyes and almost all the way, letting her lashes meet across her view. The room became a blur of color splotches and spinning lights. No big deal. Then something moved across the room toward her. It was tall. It was dark. It was almost invisible against the foggy haze of the bar. Sierra's eyes shot open, and there was nothing there. What was? You saw one. Robbie smiled at her. One what, man? I knew you could. I knew from way back. Anyway, look. Okay. Look at the wall again. Robbie, this is no kind of explanation if all I am is more confused and freaked out at the end of it. You realize that, right? Robbie raised his hand and touched the wall with his right. Sierra squinted and then almost toppled over. The tall shadow charged across the club toward them, though straight at Robbie, and then seemed to vanish into his chest. Robbie barely moved, his hand still on the wall. Sierra's eyes went into his, his painting. She couldn't, exact, she couldn't say exactly what, but something was definitely happening to the mirror now. It was different, brighter, and the painted skeleton trembled. <gasps> Robbie! Shh! Sierra watched in awe as the skeleton's painted skull turned ever so slightly as if to regard her and Robbie. It was smiling, but the skulls were always smiling with those damn death grins, so that doesn't mean anything. Then it started tapping its foot. Sarah opened her mouth to gasp, but fought it back. She promised not to freak out. And anyway, how different was this from the strange changes she's been seeing in mirrors all week? Something about it made some wild kind of sense. You ran off? Ronnie, Robbie's eyes were still closed. 
His hand still touched the wall. She shook her head and remembered she, he couldn't see her. No, I'm here. More tall, dark shadows move across the club. Sarah could sense them flickering along the edges of her eyes, but she couldn't look away from the mural. One by one, the tall shadows approached Robbie and then vanished into him. The painting brightened and then seemed to awaken. Each mermaid and monster flexing ever and turning ever so slightly as if rising from an epic nap. I just... I just... Sarah whispered. Robbie was smiling when he opened his eyes. How does older establish mood in this passage? Section 3. Application in a new text. Read and annotate the passage, then write a response to the writing prompt that follows. One of These Days by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Monday dawned warm and rainless. Aurelio Escobar, a dentist without a degree and a very early riser, opened his office at six. He took some false teeth still mounted on, in their plaster mold out of the glass case and put up on the table a fistful of instruments which he arranged in size order as if they were on display. He wore a collarless striped shirt closed at the neck with a golden stud and pants held up by suspenders. He was erect and skinny with a look that rarely corresponded to the situation, the way deaf people have of looking. When he had things arranged on the table, he pulled the drill toward the dental chair and sat down to polish the false teeth. He seemed not to be thinking about what he was doing, but worked steadily, pumping the drill with his feet, even when he didn't need it. After eight, he stopped for a while to look at the sky through the window, and he saw two pensive buzzards who were drying themselves in the sun on the ridge pole of the house next door. He went on working with the idea that before lunch it would rain again. The shrill voice of his 11-year-old son erupted his concentration. Papa, what? The major wants to know if you'll pull his tooth. Tell him I'm not here. He was polishing a gold tooth. He held it at arm's length and examined it, examined it with his eyes half closed. His son shouted again from the little waiting room. He says you are, too, because he can hear you. The dentist kept examining the tooth only when he had put it on the table with the finished work he did say. So much the better. He operated the drill again. He took several pieces of the bridge out of a cardboard box where he kept the things he still had to do and began to polish the gold. Papa, what? He still hadn't changed his expression. He says if you don't take his tooth out to his tooth, he'll shoot you. Without hurrying, with an extremely tranquil movement, he stopped pedaling the drill, pushed it away from the chair, and pulled the lower drawer of the table all the way out. There was a revolver. Revolver. Okay, he said. Tell him to come and shoot me. He rolled the chair over, the, over opposite the door, where the opposite door, his hand resting on the edge of the drawer. The mayor appeared at the door. He had shaved the left side of his face, the other side swollen and in pain. Had a five-day-old beard. The dentist saw many nights of desperation in his dull eyes. He closed the door with his fingertips and said softly, Sit down. Good morning, said the mayor. Morning, said the dentist. While the instruments were boiling, the mayor leaned his skull on the headrest of the chair and felt better. His breath was icy. It was a poor office. An old wooden chair, the pedal drill, a glass case with ceramic bottles. Opposite the chair was a window with a shoulder-high cloth curtain. When he felt the dentist approach, the mayor braced his heels and opened his mouth. Aurelio Escobar turned his head toward the light. After inspecting the infected tooth, he closed the mayor's jaw with a, caut with a cautious pressure of his fingers. It has to be with the anesthesia, he said. Why? Because, because you have an access. The Mary looked at him in the eye. All right, he said, and tried to smile. The dentist did not return the smile. He brought the basin of sterilized instruments to the work table and took them out of the water with a pair of cold tweezers, still without hearing. Then he pushed the spittoon with the tip of his shoe and went to wash his hands in the wash basin. He did all this without looking at the mirror, but the mirror didn't take his eyes off him. 
It was a lower wisdom tooth. The dentist spread his feet and gasped, grasped the tooth 